Hey everyone, this is Chris Grasso with the Indie Spirituals Podcast on the Be Here Now Network, and I am thoroughly excited today to have a very special guest, Sage Francis, joining me. Sage, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having me on your platform. Yes, sir. It's been a long time coming. I've been wanting to do this for quite a while. So before we uh, jump into the conversation, I want to read your bio for any listeners that aren't familiar with you and your uh breath of work, which is just amazing. Uh, Sage Francis is CEO of Strange Famous Records and half of the Epic Beardman, and is widely considered one of our generation's greatest lyricists. His gifted wordplay creates vivid narratives to in, uh, instigate as well as inspire, but it often derives from an accumulation of public disdain and personal turmoil. Dubbed the forefather of indie hop, a subgenre which gained great traction in the late 90s, Francis originally earned worldwide acclaim in the early 2000s by winning the most highly coveted titles of the MC Battle Circuit. This was coupled with the waves he was causing in the newly burgeoning spoken word scene. Despite having no official distribution or label support, Francis's unique brand of music spread like wildfi wildfire via the advent of file sharing networks which caught, caught the attention of labels worldwide. With his first studio album, Personal Journals, Francis daringly set aside the more boastful side of rap by catering to his poetic leanings and scathing socio-political commentary. By 2005, Sage Francis was the first hip-hop artist signed to Epitaph Records and soon became one of the highest-selling artists of his genre. Rather than abandon his day-to-day -day grind at the helm of SFR, he channeled all of his newfound resources into it, allowing the label to expand in staff as well as roster. Several studio albums and numerous sick of mixtapes later, Uncle Sage has settled into his old man shaking his fist at a SoundCloud status while continuing to push buttons from his New England home. New solo projects and a podcast are in the works. A new life is in progress. Don't poke the beard. And you can find out more about Sage at strangefamousrecords.com. Uh, I'll have that linked on my website, or if you're checking this out on the Be Here Now Network, just scroll down and the links will be there. Also to a bunch of his music and all sorts of stuff. How painful was that for you to sit through, <laughs> Sage? It was more painful to write. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really write. I wrote some of it, but I that the new bio is a um, composite of all bios that have been written about me over the years and I just took the parts that I like the best and nice. put it into a compact short bio. Nice. We got a bio mashup happening here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like when people read my bios, I always ask them to do shorter ones because it's very awkward just sitting there listening to shit being talked about yourself. And I don't know, man, but I got to say, I love the old man shaking his fist at a sound cloud. That makes me think of Abe from the Simpsons. I don't know if you're oh, a fan. Yeah, but, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> so let's start out with, for you, it's probably going to be a little boring stuff, but you know, a lot of my listeners, we definitely have hip hop heads here, but we also have people that are into spirituality and just well being <clears throat> and horror, all kinds of different listeners. So, for those that don't know about your work, if you don't mind taking us back a little bit, um, you know, to, to your origins of like being a child, I know you're around eight, if I remember correctly, when you kind of first started, you know, rhyming. And if you want to talk about really whatever you feel compelled to talk about what drew you to hip hop, anything that stands out in your childhood, wherever you want to go with that. Okay. Um, yeah, I was eight years old around eight years old. I just remember, um, there was a hip hop was kind of floating around pop culture, but it was considered a fad at the time. Sure. Um, you know, there was the break in phase and the fat that was a fad. There was like, not that b-boying's a fad, but there was like every kid in suburban America was taking breakdancing lessons at the Y, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so this sort of was around that era, and it just grabbed me. The rap is what grabbed me the most. It was the the use of rhymes. It was people talking tough. It was the bragging part of it. It was something childish about it, but also mm -hmm. I saw the serious aspects of it as well once i delved deeper and and i could find more which was difficult sure. um there wasn't hip-hop sections at record stores and my family had no idea what hip-hop was what rap you know what rappers were so i kind of did my best to make sense of it every time i would come across something that resembled what i knew to be hip-hop so i would collect those things and i would compile these things and then I was able to 
point it out to other people say hey where can i get more of this kind of stuff and um then people would point me some i can remember i was at day camp and a kid was like hey did you know that on saturday nights they play one hour of hip-hop on 88.9 uh, college stations yeah yeah <laughs> so at one and i was like what like stuff like that was just you because i maybe i you know i I, I saved maybe uh, $10 a week in allowance money and I'd get to go to the tape store yeah. and flip through tapes and find something that looked like hip hop. But I was never, to- I didn't know who they were. I just had a guess based on the cover, but this, this radio station, um, W E R S in Boston was just laying down the best hip hop. And you know, of the time it was, right. it was just gritty stuff. Right. And I would tape that and I would listen to it compulsively and they played instrumental sections sometimes so i would make little instrumentals out of that by doing pause tape mixes where i would use i had a dual cassette player on my boom box eventually <laughs> i got a boom box because nice. you know that essential hip-hop uh gear definitely <clears throat> yeah so i since i couldn't really get a lot of hip-hop i wanted to make hip-hop um and emulate my favorite rappers so i would you know write a lot of songs that some sounded like um, run DMC some eventually you know work my way toward uh, Too Short and because amazingly his tape was available in a Rhode Island mall <laughs> you know it's bizarre that yeah. stuff you could find and, and Slick Rick you know you had okay. Slick Rick songs just having fun just trying to learn you know get my chops trying to learn how to rap and doing it by myself I live I guess some other background info is important I was raised an only child yeah. so I wasn't really in a neighborhood. I lived in more of a wooded area of Northern Rhode Island. And um, I was left to my own devices for the most part. And I I was able to explore my creative side without a big brother or big sister heckling me and making me feel shitty. You know, like I could keep it my secret. Right. And I I think that was really important for developing myself as an artist where it was just me. I had to impress. It was, you know, I didn't have to worry about people making fun of me if, unless I decide to show it to them. And I knew I, I wasn't going to show it to anybody until I was sure that I was on to something. You know, it wasn't, I didn't want it to come across as some, I don't know, like some gimmick or, you know, this was me. Like, to me, it was like, that's when you're a kid, music just becomes all of you. Oh yeah. And it's your identity. And it was my identity. And it wasn't the kind of identity people in my town cared about. They didn't care about rap. They thought I was a weirdo for sure. Uh, And I was, you know, speaking on pro black matters and, you know, I've become very familiar with uh, the works of Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey. And so when your heavy metal rock and roll town has this kid that's trying to press his rap stuff on you. Luckily, I knew how to fight. (laughs) I, I understand. So, you know, I, I don't want to cut you off if you have more to say, but I got to say, man, two peas in a pod. I, we're, we're similar in age. I grew up the state next to you in Connecticut. I grew up in a town called East Haddam, which is like just like you, very wooded. Um, I was also, you know, I was a skateboarder. I was into punk and, and hardcore and alternative, but I also loved like hip hop. I mean, it started, I, I like how you said the juvenile aspect, because when I was early, it was like NWA and, you know, there's yeah. something wrong about that. But over time, and this is still in the early to mid 90s, you know, I got introduced to like Gangstar and j and KRS and, you know, these and then Cannibal Ox and just the whole kept going deeper and deeper. And it was like, wow, like so I'm in high school, you know, loving hip hop and heavy metal, rocking like Eldridge Cleaver books and Huey Newton shit. And, and same thing. It's like, you know, I, they were not a fan of that at all. I actually went back and spoke, did a whole high school address a couple of years ago. And the uh, administrator in the front office, the same woman was there, pulled me aside and apologized. That was really healing for me. She's like, we didn't know how to handle you. And like my five friends, we were total like black sheep. And she's like, we're sorry. Or I'm sorry, at least. And that meant a lot, man. So that's that's wonderful. That's good. I'd like to have that experience, too. Didn't Um, expect it. But yeah, it meant a lot. You just kind of reminded me. I I, I suppose another part of hip hop that drew me in was that it was so different from my normal life it was an escape so the things they were talking about and how they were talking about it and the sound of the music 
I just didn't like my surroundings where I lived. So that was me being able to just jump into a whole other realm. Sure. And that was it was my comic books, you know, hip hop was not just the teacher, but it was my it was it was my comic books. It was my adventure stories. It was it was everything. So yeah. it, it it was and it was brand new, you know. So it was almost like it wasn't something that was totally figured out yet. So it's not like you had it had become academic where adults could come into my room and point a finger like, no, no, that's not an element. Don't right. do that. You know. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was uh, there was a freshness to it that appealed to youth and I, I think back then it was very youth. They still say hip hop is youth generated, but it's over forty <laughs> years old. It's like at some point you have to say, well, is it even hip hop anymore? If it's not this or that, I don't know how to sub categorize hip hop because yeah. what's very popular these days isn't the type of hip hop I care about. It's not no. why I got into hip hop. So. And I'm not. I don't want to split hairs there, and and like, people would be like, "Oh, you're just old," and that's how all old people talk about new music. But it's not the same genre. It's it, we call it hip hop, but that is not the same genre. We let rock and roll splinter off into a million fucking subgenres, yeah. but rap. I mean, and you say mumble rap, they think it's a derogatory term, but no. I, I mean, at some point, you have to give it different names. I teach weekly workshops with teenagers in a residential and, and they're great kids. Like, um, you know, they're there for mental health issues, but sometimes I'll ask, you know, icebreaker questions or music will come up cause it's a great way to get them engaged. And then whenever hip hop or rap comes up, it's just like you said, like little Uzi or I couldn't name you a little Uzi song. I, I only know that name because of them. And I feel crotchety. I'm like, you know, I'm thinking of like Q-tips lyrics and, and again, KRS, Chuck D and, and stuff that meant something and real beats and like heart and passion. And I, I, I but yeah, I, I mean, who am I to judge other stuff? But I agree like that to me, that's not, you know, the, the heart of hip hop. But what are you going to do? I also feel it's in the words. It, it's in the messages. And, and that is invigorating to any age group, even as a, even when I was young, too young to truly understand what Chuck D was talking about. Yeah, the I could tell there was something. It was multi-layered. It wasn't just him. Like he said, he doesn't rap for the sake of riddling. There's something else that is driving this music, and that I feel is missing in in a lot of modern music. And I, I don't think it needs to because I think people with that kind of drive can um, engalvanize the youth. Um, and and get them excited about these things yeah. and maybe they are i asked about it uh sincerely recently as a tweet i was like hey you know out of the like what people consider mumble rap who's really saying something these days considering all the marches and protests and and yeah. um so i yeah i i understand i'm out of the loop i want to learn more about it too but i i can say without a doubt i, I don't like the sound of the music it's not the kind of rap i like and that's yes. my fucking truth. fuck off I know it's, and I agree and that's where it's like I, I give it an honest chance like because I, I want to like bond over some of the with the kids but luckily like I, I, I'm open about it I don't shit talk it to them and you know whatever like I've got tattoos so they're cool with me like that's what matters to them so I've got my in Um, but I also you're saying like the old man thing I gotta say like I do appreciate how atmosphere or slug you know is, is embraced the dad rap thing you know like I, I, I chuckle about that because you know he's we're all, we're in our forties. He, I don't know if he's fifty now or whatever, but like he's still killing it, I think. And and I appreciate like just, yeah, man, I'm old. And even uh, on the new RA record, he's talking about how he's the old man in the club with a headache and wants to go home and just calling himself out on it. You know, like. Well, yeah, his whole. I mean, we have similar um, wells that we dip from when we write our music. Like yeah. it's, it has to be life. It has to be based in what you experience in life. Yeah. Um, so. He can't be a 40, he's a, I think he's like 48. He can't be a 48-year-old writing the stuff he did when he was 27. Right. You can't, because you already said it when you were 27. Now yeah. what? Now what? Yeah. So maybe he's not talking, maybe he's not specifically targeting the younger demographic, but I think if a younger demographic cares about art um, and they hear someone speaking a truth, yeah. their truth it resonates. Right. It, it happens in every craft. It, you know, it's what doesn't resonate is when you know someone is is blowing something out of their horn that they haven't experienced. Right. 
You know? So I, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't want to get off topic of you though. Um, because you know, I, I, what I want to ask is going back, you know, you're eight and you're, well, you, you know, we got past that, but when you started doing like the rap battles, I mean, you like, it's incredible. You, you beat, um, mm-hmm. who was, I know blueprint and, um, who, but who'd you beat before blueprint? Uh, wasn't esoteric uh that was es- another battle uh, okay. esoteric was, he was in the um super bowl b- battle in boston so that was in 99 but the, <clears throat> to work my way up toward that because yeah. i was i still kind of kept it hidden and it wasn't something people celebrated in my general community so i just kept it to myself and um my mom was supportive for the early on she was supportive and like, Oh, he's really into something. Let me help. Uh, I don't know, help him explore this. And she took me to the run DMC concert with public enemy and uh, EPMD DJ Jazzy Jeff and a fresh Prince. I tell that story all the time because it's just so amazing that all those artists were on the same bill and I was 12 years old experiencing this. But then as you know, uh, parents will look at stuff that their children like, and then blame that for any ill behavior um, and try to take it away as a punishment. And in my head, I had two things to myself. It was hip hop and karate, you know, my love for ninjas and my love for hip hop. (laughs) They wanted, they liked the karate stuff. I was very involved with martial arts. They liked how it, I think centered me and gave me direction and discipline but hip hop did the same thing of course in, yeah. in different ways yeah. so i decided to just hide as much of it as i could and not let them use it as an excuse why i was failing math class mm. and um i it's crazy how long i kept it under wraps and and then um the only way there wasn't really rap shows that i could do but um there was contests there was open mics and the radio station would advertise a certain block party talent show type thing. And then my friend would drive me to it. And I was only, I was, Oh, at first I was 12 when I first, there was like youth clubs that I was 12, 13 and then 14. I was already starting a battle, but it wasn't freestyle battles. It was like, I'd get up there and say my most vicious verse and then someone would say their most vicious verse. That's right. kind of how it was back then, right. at least in our area. Um, but that got me the confidence to be on stage in front of a crowd that liked hip hop. And I needed to prove myself uh, because Vanilla Ice was the big joke of, of, of America, of the world at the time. So right. if you're a white guy trying to rap, you're automatically Vanilla Ice. So I had to get over that hump and be like, how do I prove I'm worthy of your attention. So I was doing fast rap and I was doing tongue twister style deliveries, just the stuff that is parlor trickery as far as I'm concerned. But for a 14 year old white kid to get up and, you know, Southside Providence in front of a totally black crowd and they have no idea who I am. I needed that. I like, I needed something to show, Oh, he's been working on this. You know, like this is, this is not something we've ever heard before, not around here. So, um, and pro, you know, shout out to Tongue Twister as as well as Chip Fu from the Fushnikins. He's they're the ones that really got me like excited about fast rap and like it's like, but that runs its course after a while. You know, that gets tiring. It's like someone playing a guitar solo that never ends. Yeah, and you never like, get I, into the groove. I love Da's effects, but I can only take them in pieces. Like they're f- yeah. fantastic. But I mean, yeah, I mean their first couple albums were mind blowing. Yes. the beat and everything. But yeah, that was. That was uh, definitely that was the era. I remember. Remember, the, yeah, that's right when that came out. That's right when Crisscross Jump came out, yes. and um, being a thirteen or fourteen year old kid and seeing th- that group get so huge, and uh, I thought to myself, I have a very limited window of time where I can get noticed, so a record label can pick me up and you know see the value in a white kid who's talented and willing to like put himself out there and um that obviously never happened especially not you know no one's like there's no scouts in in rhode island looking for the next big thing (laughs) right (laughs) so it was after a while i gave up on the whole idea like i graduated high school um 
I went to college. I still was battling whenever I could and building my chops um, in, in battles. But when I was in college, I discovered spoken word. And it was also around the time where my writing was getting more introspective. It wasn't the type of stuff that I was hearing from Run DMC or even Public Enemy or, you know, EPMD. It was, it was I was writing more what people would say is like um, um, confessional hmm. where I'm speaking on emo matters. <laughs> yes. I don't like but it was emotional stuff. I'm like trying to For work sure. out issues in my music and that's not the stuff you get up in front of a crowd and be like, Hey, listen to this guys. Yeah. I don't know where my dad is and blah, 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 blah. So, um, I, I start, I fell a little bit more into myself and started just writing deeper and deeper material, deeper as in not surface level, but, um, there was a lot more metaphor usage and I was kind of getting obsessed with rhyme sequences and interesting rhyme patterns that were not, um, uh, typical AABB patterns. Right. Um, and then so this was stuff I wasn't really rocking in, in like to crowds or trying to win battles with. But when I discovered spoken word, because it was uh, open mics at my college, and that's the only time I could get in front of a crowd. So I would get up there and do acapella verses. And I wasn't going to do my, like, I'm watching all these people do like real heartfelt poetry, which I didn't give a fuck about still. I didn't care. Like, I want rhymes. I want you, you know, like, I still was obsessed with rhymes. But I, I did want to perform my material. So I get up there, I started doing the more introspective material, and people were very supportive of it, which was opened me up and made me feel more confident about exploring that side of writing in a hip hop context. But um, so a couple years of that and me developing that, and then getting involved with a spoken word uh, slam scene, which yeah. was competitive based. I was already a competitive artist. Be- thanks to this this uh, battles and i did well with that and it was like i was able to easily transfer everything i had learned from the battle side of hip-hop and incorporate it into the poetry world that is maybe a good thing it may be a bad thing for me at the time it happened at the right time because it helped me um, meet a lot of influential people they i was all of a sudden um, being flown to different cities to perform as part of like a national competition and um it also showed me people who were exploring more vulnerable matters in their work and showing me the strength in it Mm. and eventually me um incorporating it into my 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 hip-hop although i was very reluctant for a while when I'm, i'm when i did do it which was a little bit before personal journals came out it was i was still kind of testing the waters i was still doing a lot of like silly battle rap stuff and just you know just fun stuff but that wasn't my lane I, you know like i don't feel like that that was everyone was doing that so it was like what am i going to contribute that's new to this this scene that's given me so much that's inspired me and 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 i i think doing the vulnerable stuff what people eventually called emo rap um helped out i, I did skip a few years there but because it, it's a very long dragged out sure. process me exploring myself as an artist and still getting comfortable with people in rap thinking i'm maybe i'm gay because i'm talking about you know cutting myself or something yeah man I, uh, and me like oh no gay is the worst thing in rap <laughs> you know like that was it was a mentality i had to shed because I I was grow I was raised on it I was raised yeah. on that, and and I mean I was too and and I'm gonna be honest man like I'm guilty and I I want to thank you by the way too you know it, it was uh, I think earlier this month I had posted an immortal technique quote and you know not trash talking anything here I just you know I've been a fan I interviewed him many years ago and he's a great lyricist and you know uh, I appreciate his intelligence but. Um, you know, I kind of would churn my eye when he would drop like, you know, derogatory uh, terms towards gay people. And just like I've done with Ghostface Killer and other hip hop artists, you know, and I, I would write it off in my head like, 
it's just the equivalent of them using like the N word or something. It, it's not an insult, you know, I, and I knew I was bullshitting myself. I can't speak for them, but either way, it's degrading. And if you're using that term as an insult, like that's that's not cool. So, you know, I made that post and, and you brought up a, a good point about uh, uh, something he had been quoted as saying. And I did look online and did some research. And so it's not just about him. It's the genre in general. And you're right, like in rap, that's like the worst, like. You know, yeah, it was, it was the accepted mentality, and it was it was a it was like a launch pad that people were safe with. We're like, all right, if I want to talk shit about a certain type of person, right. what what's the safe? What are the safe ones? Okay, gay people, women, <laughs> yeah. right, right. So, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna fucking talk shit about both these things, and um, and white people probably, which I you know is kind of un- understandable, but yeah, it was. I brought it up because it annoys me. I still haven't seen, I guess he's, he's um, like apologized for that and he's grown, uh, you know, maybe sure. he has, I don't know. I just remember there's um, we've done shows together and we've never really clicked. Uh, yeah. In fact, I knew him in the battle days too. So in the New York, when I was living in New York, um, I would, we'd cross paths there. We never battled each other, but I knew like the crew he was running with, they were very like, the angry cats, you know, they're, you know, I get it. Anger is important and it's, it's, it's fuels a lot of his music. And, um, and yes, he's incredibly smart, but I think that's why I get stuck on the homophobic remarks that he makes. Cause man, you're so smart. You want revolution, but whatever revolution you bring about, if it includes hatred of a certain group of people and you're going to be homophobic, it's, the worst like i'm i can't get behind it and no one like people need to be kind of called out for it i'm no saint i've said stuff in my music that i like now i'm 40 you know 43 years old i look back on stuff i said when i was 19 or 23 i'm like oh yeah you know like i just said something i was i knew would be acceptable at during the time and like i'm like kind of i think it's lazy you know so i've had to like atone for some of that but um yeah yeah. we're growing as a culture we're growing not hip-hop culture i mean we're growing i think as a society and and not even slowly i think there's been some great progress made over the last 20 years yeah that what is what was once acceptable no longer is so when when i catch glimpses of people who casually say faggot yeah and so you know and it just I think it's it just makes me cringe, and I I just hope it doesn't spread where people are like, oh yeah, yeah, faggots are bad, you know? Yeah, like, no, I, and, and no, like I said, I'm grateful for that, man. Because back in the '90s, I had a couple of gay friends in that small town, and like I would get in fights sticking up for them. Like, and this is when it wasn't cool to stick up for you know gay people and and so i you know i've been passionate about that as far back as i can remember and so you know again i didn't want to make it about immortal technique but i think that was a good segue into um one of course i want to talk to you and hear what your thoughts are about what's going on in the world right now you know i know you just kind of talked a little bit about it but also it's two different questions we can approach it either way but seeing this shift you know with the incredible black lives matter protests and a lot of inspiring things happening there's a jaded part of me like the old teenage chris like yeah we've seen stuff like this before is it real is it gonna just fade away i hope not i'm trying to be optimistic so that was one part of it and the other part is in relation specifically to hip-hop knowing that like the scapegoats are things like homosexuals and women like misogyny sexism do you think or have you seen i don't know are are people shifting or do you think there is the potential for a shift what's happening now so i know two different things there but yeah there is a shift there there is going to be change um it's it's wild how much change has happened thanks to the the protests and even the riots yeah we're you know no more slow rolling motherfucker you need to change now that's kind of the that's kind of the message that's out there and You do see change. You do see certain laws taking effect, and people. It's weird. Like you have you have to make uh, an officer's name go viral in order for them to face any penalties. Yeah. You know. And I think people are recognizing that. Like, why does it have to be? That, why do we have to march and then finally someone faces justice for for what they've done, and finally someone admits that police brutality 
is is an issue and i guess you're right in the i also feel like this is just going to go away eventually and then it's going to happen again in 40 years yeah at least sooner considering how quickly time moves these days yeah, true yeah. but it does go in cycles and people will become complacent i th- i think people will be given just enough to calm them down then the dust will settle they'll be quote unquote normalcy that they'll be comfortable within they'll have their playstations that keep them occupied until enough injustice happens again where people just get up in arms and it'll be an, another youth movement people who didn't really people who are too young right now to truly understand what's happening and then they're going to see it later you know in their life and then identify with oh this shit's still going on it's like now it's my turn to so how when does it end you know i don't know if enough of us become if enough like this is a this is the question a mortal technique could answer <laughs> this is his wheelhouse you know like sure. this is not my wheelhouse i understand anger i understand why people are doing what they're doing i don't know how to change it i i don't have great faith overall in humanity i i, I see how easily they're tricked i see how complacency is, is actually a comfortable um thing to like just lay back into and be like do i really want to fight every day for the rest of my life can i just can i chill for a second a couple of years yeah right right <laughs> and the powers that be understand that that is our nature that is a human thing where yeah I feel like they just have it figured out. They know, oh, they're like, oh, the riots are happening again. Okay, now we got to just change this, this, and this, but then we can reel it back after a year. Right. Uh, you know, facial recognition technology. Yeah. Oh, oh, Amazon's not going to sell it to the police for another year. They're going to hold off for a year. Then what after a year? And then we're just, now we're into this dystopian future bullshit where, well, thankfully we can wear masks we can like you're talking about complacency I'm, I live in West Hartford and it's like you know everyone was on lockdown and this and that and all of a sudden like I'm driving like down the road in major areas of like this small city and I'm not seeing masks like people got bored of it you know and you we're watching numbers rise and it's like man I'm rocking that mask like I'm not I don't want to be responsible you know like I'm doing everything I can and and it's just like you know the entitlement of some people and, and I don't want to sound crotchety but really like you just put a mask on you know it, it's not about you it's about other people And but no yeah, people I, are so self absorbed I don't get it it drives yeah. me insane they, yeah. they've just been inconvenienced too much for too long Yeah. oh man the protests about the ice cream and the golf like that was killing me and you know like oh. anyways I digress um, so I did want to ask you about writing um, I mean, you, first of all, anyone knows your music, you're an amazing lyricist. You have such a gift for, for what you do with that. And, you know, I know recently you had done, um, and I made a note of it, uh, it was with um, the Heavy Hitters Festival. It was like a one-off presentation you did. But I did see you noted that you might be doing more of that online, maybe, maybe not. You know, touring right now is not happening for anyone. So do you mind telling me a little bit about that event and um, just writing in general, like whether it is specifically towards hip hop or, you know, your passion for that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I've been going, even before the pandemic, I've been going through major life transitions and I was, I understood that touring was not going to be as much a part of my life as I had experienced for the past 20 years or more, more than 20 years. Sure. Um, so I was like, how? And I see people doing live streaming. I don't want to do a live stream show. I don't want to live off of live stream shows. And I don't know if you even can. You have to be creative with it. You have to work within the medium. So I'm trying to figure out the medium and not just like say, hey, guys, I'm going to do a half hour of raps, tune in at eight and send <laughs> donations. You know, right. if you like. Um, there is a way to freak this medium. And I'm going to. I did I did dip my toes into the live stream waters uh, a couple days ago for the yeah I did like a writer's workshop um, which was my first time doing something of the sort and it was very raw but it gave me a much greater idea of how I can do things moving forward if we're to continue that path and I don't mind doing it I don't particularly 
love explaining my process. Hmm. And I don't love telling people, oh, it would be better if you did it this way. Because when it comes to art and creativity, honestly, the true answer is if you like it, who the fuck cares? But be honest with yourself. Do you really want to be the one who likes it? Or are you trying to impress your ex-girlfriend? Are you trying to get noticed? Are you trying to go viral? Like, So when people are honest about, or do you want to win a poetry slam? Because I can teach you those tricks. Yeah. There's there's a lot of trickery in all types of writing. Writing and art is manipulative. There's, a, you know, there's so many ways you can work that magic for your purposes, but know what your purposes are and stop fooling yourself. Yeah. And then, so that's, and as scattered as I sound right now, I feel like I was, it was two hours of me being scattered during the workshop, but I did drop a lot of gems and I hope the people who needed to hear it got it. And I also don't like writing as a tool. Writing can be used for change. Writing can be a tool um, to do bad things. So sure. who am I teaching out there? Who am I giving, who am I giving the keys to? Oh, the things that I eventually learned through the process and through rep- repetition and through hard work and I finally found like certain things that work for my purposes I'm reluctant to give those away yeah yeah. unless I can trust the intent of the person who's trying to learn it for sure so yeah and I'm going to move forward in a in a in a cautious way I dig that I I really appreciate that and thanks for you know sharing what you did um I know you're also exploring the possibility of a podcast and, you know, so you're venturing into some, I mean, if there's one gift, I think, and gift probably is not the apropos word here, but you know, something this pandemic has given people the opportunity to do, not that everyone's taking advantage is all those things that have been kind of brewing in our minds. Maybe it's been a year, many years, like if only I had the time to do this or that, or maybe it's not even that it's just people are so bored. Like it took the pandemic for me at 42 to learn how to finally like set up my guitars, like how to intonate them. And like, I mean, I've been playing since I was a teenager. I, but I'll bring them in and have someone else do it. It took the pandemic for me. I I was like, all right, I have no excuse. I don't know if you can see this, but. (laughs) Oh, there you go. (laughs) This is my studio room and I still haven't put in up my, um, soundproofing. Yeah. I haven't stopped right here. Oh, sweet. That's my sweet. sound card. Um, there's, <laughs> I don't know, there's a lot of like <laughs> equipment just hanging around me waiting for me to plug it into the proper sure. holes. And, um, and then I was like, you know what? I'll just do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's got a podcast, but no, what I like yeah. about the podcast is because people are, they want me to live stream. They're like, oh, Man, you should just live stream. I I feel more comfortable in a podcast format where I can I can do it at my own pace. It's it's I can edit it if I want and I you know, I know a lot of the great podcasts just go unedited and I yeah. but I have an idea of what I want to get into and um I also want to work on speaking. I just, I'm not I I'm not much of a talker. So just getting the words out of my mouth and finding being comfortable with that it's gonna i think the podcast will you'll see a progress hopefully if i get better at it you'll see a progress in how i'm able to communicate um just with words streaming out of my mouth and me getting to a point without totally falling off course and that's my that's something i want to do and i feel like it, it has potential but um it's hard it's called hard lurk hard there. well for hard whatever lurk. I'm going to hard look on everybody. Whatever this is worth to you. I know you said a couple of times, like you're working on your speaking skills. What I've learned, you know, cause I do the public speaking thing, never set out to do it. It just fell, fell in my lap. Same with being a writer. What I've noticed in our conversation, man, is like you just have a natural persona about you. And what I've learned from my experience is that's just as important, if not more than, you know, the words. Like, I mean, of course, and we're writers. So the words are what matter to us, but for people, they want to feel that like sense of sincerity and, and humility. And, and that's, that shines through with you. You're very personable. So, you know, there's me being emo with you. Okay. Fingers crossed. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I, I think you've got it. Uh, I'm excited to check it when, when you get it going. So, um, of course, got to ask you about strange, famous records. You know, something I want to ask you, about, cause I mean, you know, that's something that's been going on since what was it? 96 or something you'd started. 
Yeah, I, I we posted it. Uh, Post- it was really didn't really start in '96. '96 when I put out my first demo. Okay, but I when I did everything myself, and I didn't have a record label name. I just I was just putting out demos, and then and by the time '99 came around, I had I did have the Strange Famous Records label name right. that I would just put on the tapes. So um, what I what I want to ask. Okay, it's gonna. Well, first of all, I go anywhere with it, and I want to know what's new. But one thing I am curious about, um, if you want to fit this into whatever you're gonna say, is there's been so many great indie labels, you know, that have come, stayed a little while, and then gone. Whether it's hip hop genre, punk, hardcore, and here's Strange Famous, like you're thriving, you're still killing it, like, and it's been a long time. So I would love to hear, like, what do you attribute that to? And and please share anything else you'd like to about the label. Yeah, well, I think Strange Famous, I wouldn't say thriving, we're hanging on. Well, okay, fair enough. Every. Yeah. I feel like every every indie label that you'd speak to right now, yeah, they'd true. say the same thing. Yeah, we're lucky to have an infrastructure. We're lucky to have a built-in audience. We're lucky to have proven ourselves over the years where we have returned customers. You know, we don't have yeah. to continually earn new listeners. That I'm so proud of. That it's one yeah. of the things I'm most proud of in my music career. I love being able to work with artists, help them get their material out to our audience. Hope, hope beyond hope that we can expand that audience with each new release and it's very rare it's it's a the market is so saturated it's so easy to put out music these days it's so difficult to get um recognition outside of your very small bubble right Uh, you know what media is really going to pick up on you um i can't even from my last two or three major releases studio releases yeah press didn't give a fuck they weren't even trying to cover it um and that was with epitaph behind it you know for for a couple of them even epitaph is like listen we can't get anything it's like no one's biting it's like if you're not brand new they don't really care you know and unless you're on tmz or whatever they don't cover it so whatever with that but within the indie world in underground hip-hop we knew our audience and we we continually you know we stay afloat I, I would love to keep it afloat and I'm probably going to put more attention into the label than I do my music at a certain point yep. and get more artists involved. We are working with tons of artists right now and it's because we're not going to be printing tons of physical media. We will always have our hands in physical media, but digital, if we can just get digital albums out to the people and get more artists working with each other and i don't know i think that there's value in that i of course we come from an era where if it wasn't on if you know you couldn't hold it it wasn't actually real right yeah (laughs) so So weird i know it's fucked up anyways it is (laughs) Like I don't like the way the way everything turned, but it's it is what it is. We're this is where we live, so yeah. we're gonna do that. We will continue to do that, and um, but starting off, it was thankfully because of physical product. It was the tapes. It was the CDs. It was people being able to buy them. They weren't down. They were downloading, but they still were in the the groove of buying something they love right. and wanting to own it. That's not where people are at anymore. But unless we figure out, you got to figure out tricks like, oh, that new T-shirt. Oh, that's limited. I need that. You know, trick. Like yeah, you got to be <laughs> a marketing genius all of a sudden. You can't just make good fucking music. You killed me with that. I, I saw like recently you'd put that new shirt up, the Strange Famous with the uh, bridges we burn. And I was like, oh, yeah, note to self order. I go to order it this morning, sold out. I'm like, motherfucker, see? Yeah. Good marketing. Success. Right. Good job, <laughs> sir. Love um, to hear that. So yeah, the good on you. Um, so yeah, so let me ask you this, man. So you know, kind of like bringing everything together, and there's still a couple other questions for you, but to to bring all of this together, eight years old, rhyming, doing your battles, strange, famous, epitaph. Which I wish we had more time because I want to ask you about that. But there's a few other things I think will be more pressing for this. You know, here you are, and this is your life now. You know, like you know, hip hop and strange, famous, as far as like work wise and and whatnot. Did you, I mean, I, I appreciate you're saying like, I, I had this window of opportunity and I had to strike, you know, and you went after it, but yeah. did you ever think like that this is, you were going to be able to do it, like make it? Um, I was reluctant for a while. Cause I, um, 
I ha- I went first went to Dean College for two years. It's a two year college. Yeah. Um, I graduated and then I moved to New York because I I didn't want to get a job yet. I wanted to still see what was out there for me if I could get discovered. Sure. Or, like still on that shit. I was still trying to like get discovered. And I was like, I got to go to New York to get discovered. That's just how it was done. So I go out there and like look for ciphers and rap. And I did. I made a lot of good connections out there, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't, I eventually ran home with my tail between my legs because I couldn't really afford New York City. Yeah. And um, then I went back to college. I was like, all right, I guess I got to get a real degree now. And I studied journalism and, um, and I, I was always rapping, nothing. I was like rap. Hip hop was mostly what I spent my time on. In fact, the reason I went to URI, uh, University of Rhode Island, is because of the radio station. The, they had a hip hop show from three to six every weekday. So that brought me there because I was like, I'm going to get on that radio show, but you have to be a student. So I would. that's what I did. I went there. I studied journalism because journalism was easy enough to fake my way through. <laughs> you know, it's not going to take up too much of my mental capacity. I can sure. actually just breeze by if you can write some sentences and whatever. I, I cheated my way through that, <laughs> that old course. <laughs> right, right. I wanted a rap. So I went to the radio station and I just just promoted myself, self-promoted, self-promoted. I started making connections, started like just freestyling on everybody's shows. Then I'm winning the battles and then the internet's big and then like a Napster's there and everyone's able to like say, hey, who's this Sage Francis dude? Like, let me see. Oh, they have my music in Sweden now. Oh, or, okay. People know who I am all over the world. I can travel. So once I realized all the seeds that I had planted, not all of them blossoms, right. but to plant as many seeds as I did and wait for some type of critical mass where it was like, now I can chill and say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get a job. This is going to be my job. It was when I started getting shows in various cities, not just in the country, but around the world. And they were paying me enough for me to pay rent. And then once I realized I had enough shows lined up that I'd have rent paid for several months, I quit my job at Ben and Jerry's. I was like, as much as I like ice cream and scooping it and, you know, giving it to kids, like free samples of shit. I was like, I'm out of here. Peace. <laughs> and, um, you know, I grinded it out. I just, there was none, especially because of the internet. Now I could talk to anybody. So I'm like, I never got to speak to the artists I liked. I never got to have interactions, you know, with, yeah. with my favorite artists. I was like, I'm going to give that anyone who likes my music who wants to reach out. Let's talk. Like, yeah. I'm always going to be available to you. And I created a forum, a message board that uh, it was the nonprofits forum at first, and then it became Strange Famous Forum. Yeah. Stuff like little things like that really, really, really helped out. It really helped everything grow. It helped a, a community build. And, um, and I just went real hard. I mean, people will always ask, you know, what's the trick? What's, can you give me some advice? Like, give up your idea of having fun. Give up your idea of going to parties. There was no parties. There was no after parties. There was grinding it out, making sure everything was on point, making sure your business was in order, making sure you were, you know, you were honest and yourself because that's the only way longevity works. Yeah. You can't keep recreate. You can't keep a lie going for too long. Yeah. So if you're speaking in someone else's voice, you're going to run out. Your well will run dry. Yeah. You know? Keeping all this in mind as I was, as I was going and, and learning as much as I could as I went and ruining every relationship in the process because, again, like social life was nil. Um, and now, now all of a sudden my whole life flipped upside down because I got married, um, helping raise two kids. We have a son expected in October. Um, touring is out of the question. So everything my life was – for over 20 years is gone, gone. <laughs> totally different and i'm still not having parties but i <laughs> i have to take myself away from my work quite frequently to take care of domestic duties and um even label stuff you know sure. work that isn't music related because most most of what i do has never really been actually recording songs or writing songs it's it's all the extracurricular stuff that you have to dedicate yourself to. And the reason why you have to take on all those tasks is because 
Sure, you can get a manager. Sure, you can get a driver. Sure, you can. But then you have to pay them all. Yeah. You know, if you can multitask, if you can take, if you can wear several hats and it's not going to affect you negatively, and I'm not saying it didn't affect me negatively, but at least it helped pay for my house. Yeah. You know, at least I was able to get certain things situated that I needed situated in my life. You know, pay off, pay off my student loans, you know, help bury a relative, <laughs> you know, like all these things that pop up in, in life as you grow older, the expenses never go away, man. It's like, holy shit, this is I'm lucky that I, I never, I was never a spender. I, I, I hoarded my money because I was like, I know I'm not going to be able to live off this forever. And sure. it, it's the money I'm making. Let's put it away and save it. Cause it's going to be a day, a dark day, yeah. many days that this is going to come in handy and I don't want to s- stress out for the rest of my life. So, yeah. So relatable, man. Like at the, one of the greatest gifts, I think punk and hard hardcore gave me was the installation of like the DIY ethics because just like you I'm, I'm no Sage Francis but like you know I have three books with Simon and & Schuster that's what I do for a living you know this podcast I do because I love doing it but I'm an author a public speaker I don't have an assistant I don't have a manager I'm you know I'm only like six years into this but I work seven days a week and and I have to be very mindful because I am not married or have kids but I'm engaged and I don't, you know, I see that it pulls me away and I have to be very conscious to like pull myself out. And it's tough when you're doing everything yourself. So I know people see like you've got records out and you've got shirts and, you know, it's like, oh man, that's, that must be the life. And and I'm not saying it's not, I'm sure it's wonderful, but people often don't understand the amount of work that really goes into that. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I don't think you would either, but. Um, you know, yeah. And part of the work is knowing who to let into your fold. Uh, right. Cause I do, I get tons of assistance from uh, this guy Storm Davis, who's been running Strange Famous for since 2008, 2009. Yeah. Without him, the label's gone. Like I have to acknowledge, I have to acknowledge like who really can hold it together without me micromanaging everything. Because right. I did that to him at first. I'm like, I need to know everything you're doing at all times. And then eventually, I'm like, all right, you do this better than I can. Thank you. You are worth, you know, you are worth more than I can pay you. (laughs) So so like there are people, thankfully we are able to exist as a label because not only people like him, but volunteers, talented fans who are like, Hey, want to do a video? Like, yeah, I want to do a video. They're so fucking expensive though. Like, Hey, well, you know, I can do this and like, fuck yeah. And then we make it work out. We got designers. Like people are like, man, I'd love to design a, a cover for you. Like, really? Thank you, because sometimes those cost $3,000. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> you know? so, oh, I do know. Big shouts to all the people who've, who've, not, who've helped us and you didn't get paid enough. And we try to make it up for you in other ways. And people who just love our stuff so much that, you know, they contribute because yeah. they want part of something that they believe in that's yeah. been instrumental. Yeah, man, I, I, I resonate. It means so much, you know, that and that you get to share their work, too. You know, it's something they love. Right. They love you and you're a fan of their work. And, it, you know, it's wonderful. Um, So yeah, I know we've only got a few minutes left. There's a, t- a shitload of stuff I wanted to talk to you about. But two things I would love to end this with. And I'm going to put them together. You take them as you want. Because um, part of it is going to go in the mental health direction um, because I'm passionate about that. I work with a lot of younger people and, and I know you've talked about experiences with your sister and whatnot going on, but also I want to share a post and, and go into you're married now, you know, and, and, and that's amazing. And like you said, you're raising two girls and you have a son on the way. Like that's so rad. And this post you'd shared, if, if, I hope you don't mind me reading. I mean, it's on Facebook, but um, I was really touched by this when it was earlier. I think it was earlier this month. Um, let me see here. You had wrote, uh, oh, it was like, yeah, June 9th. You were on this day 10 years ago. We released the video for Best of Times. That was back when I was still wondering if I'd live long enough to see marriage or have kids. I don't think I'll live long enough to see my kids have kids. But hey, it's not the end of the world. It's been a hell of a trip, folks. I mean, that's incredible, you know, like because I've I've gone through mental health and I don't know actually the extent to which, you know, you I, I know you've talk about things but I don't know a lot about your personal life and I'm not asking you to share anything you're not comfortable but uh you know I I've gone through it I, we've all gone through it in some regards some heavier than others so I ask this question more for like the teens I work with I mean I think anyone can benefit hearing from any experience or anything so if, if there's anything in that regard 
like your journey like and here you are like in a place you didn't think you know at one point in your life you'd make it to i didn't think i'd live to see 40 you know like i've died like i've been on a hospital bed intubated because i couldn't breathe i didn't think i'd be here thank god i am you know that's why i'm so passionate about giving back and doing things so if you know if you have any words about that and then i'll pick it up and we'll go into the 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 father marriage thing because i really want to ask you about that too i can't help it those lovely fingernails you have um yeah <laughs> i've been peeling them off but they still <laughs> linger um well part of the that the song i was referencing is called the best of times yeah and in that song i really do i i guess i tell my life story um and it's kind of cryptic but enough where I do, I tell my personal truths, but in a way where a lot of other people can relate like, Hey, I know what that was like, you right. know? Right. Um, and stuff I never, I always hold on to it's stuff that was always in me. And for some reason that instrumental, the music, um, what is his name? Oh, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank. Um, he did the soundtrack for Amelie. Oh, uh, and I know who you're talking about too. Um, I will, you keep I'm talking. Not, I'm going to look it up while you're speaking because it's got to give respect where it's due credit. So I had one night to write a song. I, I received that music um, on the last night I was recording my album. And I stayed up listening to that music and it just brought all those images from my life. I was like, what I'm going to write about. Obviously, I have to write about uh, something that means something to me, something that I've been holding on to. And I, it was an inventory uh, that I, I went through and all these things I never would have put in rap songs or even poems up to that point. And like, it just flowed out. I was like, man, I was in love with a girl in fourth grade. Isn't that weird? It was like, and I'd never talked to her. I was in love with her right until eighth grade. Not. And then I realized, Oh, that wasn't love. I had a real weird sick crush. And I, like I, internalized it and it came out in other ways and i was like mm. and then this happened in my life but man when that when that went wrong i i thought maybe i would kill myself because i thought that's all that mattered in life and like coming to these realizations in each stage of your life like man everything you thought was so big everything you thought was so important if you just give yourself the time to power through make it to the next stage so you can look back at least give yourself that chance Give yourself a chance to look back on it and yeah. say, hey, that shit was not as big as I thought it was. And, you know, that those lessons that, that when people don't get to learn those lessons, that's that hits so hard, man. It makes me so sad when yeah. someone just decides to leave and you're like, man, that could have been worked out. I know it. You know, yeah. maybe you didn't have yourself in the right group of people. Maybe you didn't have a support system and you didn't believe you were worth the support system. But um for all that I've seen and all that I've gone through and all that I've lived and all I've been told and everything I know and think and like, you got to give yourself a chance. That's it. Don't yeah. give up on yourself. Yeah, man. I really dig that. I respect that. And, and, and thank you. Like when I share that with teens, I feel kind of corny because I picture teenage Chris, like listening to someone say that and it's like, right. fuck that noise. But no, really that's, that's, I'm grateful to hear you say that I'm grateful that I'm here to recognize that as such a deep, real truth. Like I just lost a friend to suicide this month, you know, with, and it's definitely not the first and sadly probably won't be the last. And like you said, it, it could have worked out if you just held on, but you know, I wasn't in this individual's shoes and I just, you know, hopefully they're at Yeah. Peace. That's sort of thing. You never know. Some yeah. people, because mental health is your reality. It's yeah. your reality. You yeah. can't, understand what's outside of your reality if, if but if you can if you can give yourself that glimpse that little glimmer of of maybe you know maybe it can be different some can't i kind of understand it you know i, I just why it hurts so much because you're like you're wrong <laughs> you know? yeah. that's so frustrating it's like you're fucking wrong yeah. it, it could something can happen maybe i don't know maybe i sound like an asshole but the reason the reason i said you know I don't think I'm going to live to see my kids have kids is because I'm, this is my first son that's coming. Right. Yeah. And I'm at the age my, my father was when he died. Oh. And I don't really know any men in my family who've lived much longer than this. My grandfather was he lived to be the oldest. He lived to be 63. Okay. And 
you know, it's just those kind of things I think about. Like, I really, my window, I'm not going to pretend I'm living forever. Like, let me accept yeah. my reality. Like, I hope not. Like, I need to li- I need to push on for these kids and my wife. I love, you know, my family. I love them all to death. I just, <laughs> people are like, oh, you're going to, no, that, don't worry about it. You're going to see your kids get married. No, like, well, probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Oh, that's another reason I want to do my podcast. I was, I was like, maybe I'm not – I want to be able to speak and and say things plainly. I don't want to speak in trickery. I don't want to have like little labyrinth lyrics that right. a, a 10 year old or a 20 year old son of mine has to like sit down with a fucking calculator and bang out an equation. Like I would like to speak in a manner he can speak, like listen to and make sense of and tell my story and help like learn other people's stories. That is a weird motivation for me as well. Yeah. That's so cool, man. So I mean, to, to, to add, bring this to a close, um, let's, let's, if you're cool, that just, you know, I, I gotta say, first of all, congratulations, you know, you're married, you, it's amazing, I, thank you, she's so lucky. high, by the way, oh, thanks, yeah, I mean, I gotta say, for listeners, like, it was crazy to me, you know, you're married to a friend of mine, like, we're not super close, but, you know, we love hip-hop, and we've, you know, we're running circles, and I'll never forget, man, when I saw her, I just saw it on Facebook, the picture, and I had to, like, wait, that's Sage Francis, and it was, like, <laughs> I text her. I'm like, am I crazy? You know, you both like are wonderful people. I'm, I couldn't be happier. You know what? Two great people. So how is like marriage? And, and now you're like you said, you're raising these kids and, and you're embracing it. Obviously, I love that you have your finger. Yeah. If you're listening to this podcast, you can't see if we've got some hot pink and green going on. Um, how is that? What's your experience been like? How has that cha- has it changed? I mean, no, it's changed you. Like, how has it changed you? And it's changed me um, a lot. My yeah. whole my whole thing is flipped. Um, it's exhausting. It you know it's. Um, <laughs> I'm still trying to make sense of it because again I lived alone for so long. Yeah. Um, I was raised an only child. You know, like now I'm suddenly living with three females. <laughs> it's <laughs> the energy is different. I again I don't speak often. I'm not a talker in part and I don't even get to really have adult conversations with my wife because you know the four year old is a chatterbox and you can't get a word in edgewise. But it's like little things like that. I love that. You know, I'm cool with that and I'm always looking for teachable moments and I, I will step out of the way sometimes when I feel like I need to step out of the way, but I'm always trying to help out however I can. Um my domestic duties have increased a billion. Sure. So like I want to, I don't mind taking myself away from my music in order to take care of the house, get my house in order and make sure we have a safe, stable, happy environment for the people I love. Mm -hmm. But that is a lot of work. It, it, it it demands a lot of me and my time and, and my energy. And again, I'm burned out. I'm not so like, Hey, what do you think about this going on in the world? And that I'm like, I don't even really know what's going on. (laughs) Some. Like I have no idea. Of course, I don't listen to the new rap because I'm I don't have time to listen to new music. I if when I have time to listen to music, I'm usually working on music or with our artists at Strange Famous. Yeah. So I have to admit that I'm totally out of the loop. But it's not the it's not the existence that I've known sure. for a very long time. So I'm adjusting. I've I've had to shift. There's a lot in my head that I need to shift my where my priorities are and where to focus my attention and my energy. How do I make it work, though? That's that's how the world is so different all of a sudden, not just my personal life, but, you know, pandemic hits and yeah. and, you know, this and that is just like, whoa, OK, I'll take it one fire at a time. That's how I'm dealing with it. That's how my wife and I ever since we met, it's been one fire at a time. There's a lot. Like I can't even get, I will not get into most of what we've had to deal with, but for sure. it's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. fucking lot. And I never would have done it for anybody else until I met her. I couldn't be happier, man. Like I said, that, so happy for both of you. Please give her my regards. I'll, I'll hit her up soon. It's been too long. Um, but thank you, man. I, like you said, I know you're super busy. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to have this conversation. And, and thanks for your raw authenticity, man. I didn't expect anything less, but I really appreciate you uh, chatting it up with me, you know, not being much of a talker. Like you said, you did great, man. I had a really lovely time. 
<laughs> thank you. So, man. Sage, thank you very much. And um, again, for anyone listening, watching strangefamousrecords.com, um, if you are not familiar with Sage's work, and even if you aren't a typical hip hop fan, please check it out. It's, I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. It's, it's art is what I would call it. And I mean that totally sincerely. So Sage, thank you not only for your time, but for everything you've brought into this world, you've gifted a lot of people with some really cool shit. So thanks, man. Yeah.